All right, so what have we done so far? Last class we talked about um, GDP a bit more. We noted that GDP equals income, and we discussed various measures of the price level, as well as <clears throat> a few other macroeconomic aggregates that had to do with the labor market. So today we're going to start on a sort of whole new approach to thinking about these things. So in our first class, you may recall that I mentioned that we're going to be following a sort of pattern here, where first we define whatever it is that we're going to talk about, then second, having thought through carefully what it is that we're actually discussing, in this case, for example, GDP or the price level, we then proceed to use economic theory to try and analyze why it behaves the way it does. So in the case of GDP, the two things, that, the two phenomena that we, that we would like to understand are, first of all, why is it that there is long-run economic growth? Why is it that GDP per capita seems to grow over time everywhere? Not every, not every year, of course. There are times when there are contractions, but again, if you look decade on decade, you can see that there's this overall upward trend. And second, why it is that there is the business cycle? Why, if you look at what's happening around that trend, you see sometimes rapid growth and sometimes you know, shrinkage. So today is when we start thinking about theory a bit. <clears throat> now, when you were in micro and you try to think about why not the quantity of total goods and services, but the quantity of, let's say, a particular good or service might change over time, there's a very well-defined theory that you used to think about this. And that was the theory of supply and demand. <clears throat> what's really behind this? What's really behind this is the idea that, first of all, while we do a lot of math in economics, fundamentally, economics is a social science. We're trying to understand human behavior, it's just that we're trying to understand human behavior in a particular context. And if what we're trying to understand is the production of a particular good or service, to understand that we have to think of, well, this good is being produced by a bunch of people. Right? And they're not robots, they're producing it for a reason. And so what we're doing then, when we start to think in terms of supply and demand, is that we're thinking, okay, why is anyone making this? What are the fundamental motives? And they're actually, in the case of the market for a particular good or service, two very distinct groups of people involved there who have very distinct and different incentives. One is the set of people who are producing the thing. And we have to think about, well, what are the incentives of the people to make this stuff? And then the other group of people is whoever it is who wants to buy the thing whatever good or service it is that we have in mind. And then we think of them independently. And demand and supply curves, what are they? They're just summaries of us sitting down as economists or as just people using their sort of common sense, thinking about how other people behave, and summarizing the incentives of all the buyers into the demand, and summarizing the incentives of all the suppliers into the supply. And that's how we get things like, well, um, Supplier, a supply curve is upward sloping. Why? Because a higher price will encourage people to sell more of this thing or try and produce more of this thing. Demand curves slope down. Why? Because if something is more expensive, people will not be able to afford it or prefer an alternative or just not get anything. Right. So that's, that's a big chunk of your micro class in two minutes. In macro, we're going to do something similar. We're not talking about the production of a particular good or service. We're talking about the total production of final goods and services in a place over a period of time. But still, we will also find this approach to be useful. The approach of organizing all the buyers or the incentives of the buyers on the one hand and thinking about that and then separately <clears throat> putting up a firewall and thinking about the incentives of the suppliers on the other hand. Right? Of course, some, you are both a buyer and a supplier, right? We all are. But 
our incentives to buy and our incentives to supply are distinct. And so that's what we're going to do. So the way we're going to call these incentives or these groups of people, however you want to think about it, we're not going to call them demand and supply because you already have that term in your micro mind to make sure that you know that we're talking about something different because we're talking macro here. We're talking all final goods and services. We're going to refer to them as aggregate demand and aggregate supply. So by now you should have become somewhat used to the idea of to the, to the idea that we keep calling things aggregate, what we mean is it's macro, it's adding up all, all the final goods and services. Okay? So we're going to try and understand how it is that GDP behaves and also how it is that the price level behaves and then from then also how it is that um, labor markets behave. That's going to kind of fall out naturally from this discussion by thinking about aggregate demand and aggregate supply. This is going to carry us from now basically through the end of the semester. Now I'm just going to talk about this in broad terms, but uh, later we'll get into a lot more detail. So, and this is going to be helpful for your homework this week, although I know many of you already completed it, many with 100% um, scores. When we think about aggregate demand, very often, the way we approach it is by thinking about, well, I guess going back to what I said earlier, we're going to approach aggregate demand by thinking what are the incentives behind um, buying final goods and services, or what are the limitations behind buying final goods and services. And as you'll see in the textbook, very often we find it convenient to approach this by thinking about the fact that they're actually some combination of very different kinds of goods and services out there. To the extent that they're different, there might be different reasons why you want to buy them. And also very different entities out there that do the buying. And thus they might have different incentives to, to um, do the demanding. And so what we're going to do is we're going to break down aggregate demand into certain pieces that you should find useful going forward. Um, the first piece <coughs> is the largest piece. It's about not quite two-thirds of GDP, I guess. And that is things like this. Right? One of the things that we demand are the things that we use on a day-to-day -day basis. So we're going to give that a name. And that name is going to be consumption. So consumption is goods and services that you use up. when you obtain them. And you might think, as opposed to what? What kinds of goods don't you use up? Well, goods that you don't use up are goods that, are, that endure for a while. Like you may make use of them, but they're still around when you're done using them. Things like what? Things like this phone, right? I keep using it when I'm when I'm done with it, it's not gone. I didn't digest it. I can use it five minutes later or tomorrow or next year. This computer, right? this building, these are all things that at some point were produced, but when you make use of them, it doesn't use them up, so to speak. These are called, <clears throat> actually, there are several ways of referring to this. One way is you can refer to them as what are called capital goods. And capital goods refers to the fact that essentially these are goods that you use to make other goods or services. Right? In the case of this phone, I use it to make communication services for myself. Right? That, that doesn't add to GDP, but you know, I'm using it. This computer is used to generate educational services. Um, machinery in a factory, same thing, right? it makes other stuff but it doesn't get used up or incorporated into something else in that process. So those are called capital goods. But typically, um, keep in mind that macroeconomists, when you see 
us refer to the whole collective of all the capital goods in the economy, the new capital goods, the newly produced capital goods, we're going to refer to that as investment. So in a macro context, the word investment means newly produced capital goods, meaning newly produced machinery or structures. Structures means buildings, bridges, oil rigs. <coughs> now, broadly speaking, remember I said there are different types of goods, there are also different kinds of buyers. So broadly speaking, consumption is stuff that you and I buy. And broadly speaking, capital goods are things that companies buy because they use these things to produce other things. There's some exceptions because you and I also own some capital goods, right? Like my phone, your computer, your refrigerator. Um, by the way, these are sometimes also referred to as durables, just so. That term is better at distinguishing how these things are different from these, right? But there's another entity aside from you, me, and all the companies that make stuff that might also demand stuff. Actually demands roughly, I think, a fifth of GDP. Can you think of any entity that buys a heck of a lot of stuff, but that's neither you nor me? Yeah. Uh, sir? Government? Yeah, the government. So we represent that with a big G, and that's government spending. So that varies in size from place to place. Some countries have large governments in terms of their spending, some have smaller governments. But it's there. And that's actually important because if you think about it, you know, this is, this consumption is, the consumption, the decisions that determine consumption are made by millions of people. The decisions that go into investments are made by millions of people and maybe millions of companies, certainly hundreds of thousands. So these are ultimately very decentralized decisions. But government spending, you know, that's not so widely spread. Government spending, well, let's think about this country. There's a president, there's a Congress, and then I guess there are the states as well. They make their own decisions. But the states also have a governor and a little Congress. Little, as if, well, okay. and a Congress. So. These decisions are made by a much smaller group of people. So what that suggests is that whereas you know, our decisions kind of add up and, of course, are going to result in GDP changing over time due to various factors that affect our spending, this is something that can be decided more centrally, suggesting that because government spending is here, GDP could actually be maybe perhaps affected on purpose, on purpose by whoever it is who runs the government. So one of our big topics, one of the big topics in any macro course is going to be the idea of macroeconomic policy, using whatever <coughs> um, government entities can control to try and actually purposefully affect GDP. Here's the first time that's showing up. Moving government spending on purpose to try and affect GDP is referred to as fiscal policy. So we'll spend a whole, at least a day, if not two, if not more, discussing the idea of fiscal policy, which is the idea of using government spending to actively manage GDP. Okay. So what's left? We have the consumption that you and I perform. There is the investment that you, me, and Walmart, and Amazon, and so on perform. There's government spending. Are we missing anyone? Actually, we are. Because aside from all the entities, let's say we're talking about GDP here. So aside from all the entities that are here that might buy final goods and services made here, there are also entities abroad that might buy goods and services made here, right? So we need to keep them in mind 
I'm going to call it this, uh, the X standing for exports. So exports are goods made here, <coughs> but they were actually per goods or services made here that were purchased by buyers abroad. And those buyers could be individuals, they could be companies, they could be governments even, but we're just going to lump it all in together with exports. And similarly, of course, some of what you consume may not have been made here. This thing says, where is it? Made in Taiwan. So, if we want this whole thing to equal GDP, anything that was made outside has to be subtracted, right? So, we have to subtract imports. Let me check. Let me do a quick notation check. Yeah, imports. Um, I think the textbook, what they do, if I'm not mistaken, is they lump these two together, the exports minus the imports, and they call them net exports. <coughs> it's the same thing. Net exports means exports minus imports. <coughs> so, Aggregate demand, we're going to categorize in this way. We're going to break it down into pieces based on, again, it's sort of the, two, the allied notions here about who it is who is doing the demanding, but also each category also involves very different kinds of goods. And so the two ways of thinking about it kind of line up. All right? Any questions, thoughts, comments about this? You will find this useful in your homework because there'll be some questions that are saying, okay, is um, <coughs> let's say, um, I don't know, is, um, if you buy a car, is it consumption or investment? Well, a car, do you use up a car? Do you eat it? No. It's clearly a capital good, so it's investment. So you have to sort of think along those lines to answer the question. Okay? And I know many of you did the homework already. In fact, I think, I think three quarters of the class did the homework already, so that's very encouraging. Bless you. All right, so we've talked about demand. Let me check the time. And that's arrogant demand. Let's switch to <coughs> speaking in broad terms about aggregate supply. <coughs> So, aggregate demand was us thinking about why is it that you might, what, motiv what might motivate you to buy different kinds of goods and services. When we're thinking about aggregate supply, we have to think about things differently. Then our problem is, why is it that anyone would produce anything? <clears throat> and if we're talking about GDP, total amount of final goods and services produced, and we're thinking about a market economy, And we ask the question, what motivates suppliers? Again, we're not thinking about, let's say, you or me producing something at home for personal use. Right? That doesn't count in GDP anyway. We're thinking about things like, why would a company produce this? Or this. Of course, they're producing it for sale, and what motivates them to um, perform those sales? Well, what do they get from it? They get, as we discussed last week, or actually on Monday, they earn income from it. Specifically, they earn <coughs> profits, right? They sell the thing, 
And of course, they have to incur costs to make the thing in the first place, to transport it to the sales point, and so on. But at the end of the day, <clears throat> as long as the revenue exceeds the costs, they are generating profits. So that's what's motivating the suppliers. So when we're trying to analyze, just like in micro, actually, when we're trying to figure out exactly how suppliers might respond to changes in different conditions, our analysis is going to be anchored in the idea of, well, if conditions change in this way, how does that affect their behavior? Keeping in mind that it's the profit motive that, under, that ultimately determines that behavior. Great. So that's the why. The second question is how does production occur? Right? If we want to think about production, we're going to need at least some kind of theory of how it is that production actually happens. Right? You don't just conjure um, green tea or cell phones out of thin air. Right? There has to be some process that generates it. And just, I mean, you know how production occurs, right? This thing had to be assembled from various parts. This thing had to be harvested and, you know, processed in some way and combined into this final good, and so on. So, we're going to have a, or rather macroeconomists have a sort of simple metaphor or artifice to try and summarize how it is that production occurs. And I think it's simple and intuitive at the same time as we'll see it's actually going to very quickly give us some very powerful ideas. Powerful ideas in the sense that they crystallize um, remember, we started with this question of why does growth occur? Why does the business cycle occur? I'm going to write down this metaphor for how production works, and it's going to very rapidly narrow down our, these questions into very specific things. Yes, it's 10 o'clock, time to open your Red Bull. I'm half waiting for a colorful motorcyclist to spin into the room <laughs> and make some silly advertisement, but nope, so far so good. All right, so this metaphor <clears throat> for how it is that production occurs is called the production function. And <clears throat> production, of course, you understand we're talking about GDP, so, and we're talking about GDP from the perspective of supply, so of course that's why production is there. What about function? Function is here in the, it's referring to the way in which, um, it sorry, it's referring to the concept of function in mathematics. What's a function in mathematics? You have, in mathematics, you have something like y equals f of x, right? It means y equals some function of x. You give me x, this thing transforms it, and out pops y, right? And say, let maybe, for example, maybe this is x squared. Then I know what, you give me x, out, y comes out. So we're going to have a similar view of how it is that um, the production of GDP occurs. Let me do this twice. First, I'm going to think about this from the perspective of a particular firm that's making a particular good. And then we're going to add it up and do everything from the macro perspective. So the production function from the micro perspective is the following. You have a company that makes a particular good, right? And you're just going to call it output. I'm not, gonna, not going to worry about exactly what it is. But it could be tea, it could be 
Cell phones could be buildings. Now we know that in order to make the output, you had to start with a bunch of inputs, right? And what kind of inputs might we have in mind? Well, as discussed before, there could be all sorts of inputs. There could be labor. The most important one counts for two-thirds of GDP. There's another input on the board here already. You may need machinery or buildings in order to help um, make whatever it is that you're making. <coughs> Bless you. As discussed, there may also be intermediate goods involved, right? And you could try and make the list, the, sorry, the list longer if you wanted. I guess we could think of energy maybe as being distinct from intermediates, although. Um, not sure if that's worth it. So somehow, something has to happen that combines these intermediates and makes the output, right? There's some process that combines them <coughs> that um, I guess it combines the intermediates to make the output, but also somehow capital goods must be involved right, in getting the things from A to B or in assembling them. And the humans are involved as well, whether they're operating the machines or physically assembling something and so on. So all of that involves what? It involves engineering, it involves management, it involves organization. We're going to lump all of that into one thing. We're going to call that process that combines all the inputs to produce output. We're going to call it technology. And as discussed, and again, if you think about it, there are all sorts of things that we can name, that we can study as economists or non-economists that would qualify as things that affect um, how well or just how in the first place these inputs are combined to make outputs. For example, I guess, first of all, there has to be some kind of knowledge involved, right, like the science and engineering embodied in here. That's, I guess, the kind of thing that you usually think of when someone says technology to you. You think of, okay, um, science and engineering, either in someone's head, either embodied in someone's head, that would be labor, or maybe embodied in the capital, or maybe embodied in the layout of the factory floor. Um, well, I, maybe I should write scientific knowledge or engineering knowledge rather than just knowledge, because that's a bit broad. Scientific knowledge. But again, remember, two-thirds of GDP is people, right? So at least as important as knowing how to combine atoms or objects is going to be what? How to combine people. How to manage teams. How to manage hierarchies how to get on with each other. So <clears throat> how to make sure your employees get on with each other. Okay. So we're going to just call, we could call that management. Um, or organization, I guess. Because part of it is the two distinct aspects, right? One is the day-to-day -day interaction between you and me and our manager and so on. Um, but another is, you know, any organization, whether it's GW or Walmart, has certain rules. Right? There's certain things that, certain aspects of our interaction that are kind of baked in when the organization was set up. Right? So, 
I mean, just to think of an example, the code of academic integrity, right? That affects how we interact. And it's kind of given, and it would be difficult to change. And actually, the code of academic integrity is very different in different places, right? So how that affects how you and I interact at GW, um, or the result of having that academic integrity code, um, means that things that happen here may be different from things that happen at, I don't know, Carnegie Mellon, where, like here, if you are accused of a violation, you get a hearing, and you may be um, exonerated. In Carnegie Mellon, if you're accused, you're out. Right? That would change how things, <clears throat> how things happen. So organization is a bit broader than just management, which sounds more like that's how you and I talk. Right? This means how the place was set up in the first place. And any other aspects of technology? I can't think of anything right now. So, um, <clears throat> so that's it. This is the idea of the production function. The inputs come in. There's this technology that combines them, and it has these aspects. And they result in the generation of the output, which is then brought to market and sold, sold to who? Demand. Okay, So that's the production function, or the idea of the production function from the micro perspective. Any questions, thoughts, doubts about this? All right, so again, this is a macro class, so what we want to do is try and, you know what? Let me take a picture of this before I erase it. This is a macro class, so what we want to do is see if there's a way of updating this to think about things in macro terms. So let's do that. <clears throat> if we wanted to update this into macro terms, the first thing I want to do is remind ourselves that before when we wrote output, we meant a particular good. But when we're talking macro, we mean all final goods and services. So why don't we just write that? Just to make sure that it's clear what we're talking about here. Real GDP. <clears throat> and then, what about the inputs? When we mean labor, we don't mean the labor of one, the, the labor employed by one particular company. We mean aggregate labor, right? All employment or all hours worked. When we mean capital here, we mean all the capital that's available to produce. And these guys go away, right? Because an intermediate good is produced by someone, but then it gets eaten up by someone else. So, yeah, it's part of the, what you might call, actually, I think I need a chair to get up there. Hopefully I won't get an injury. That was dramatic. Part of the aggregate production process. So since we're no longer thinking about a firm, we're thinking about the entire economy as sort of a giant factory. What we're referring to now is the aggregate production function, the, the function that produces GDP. So we have aggregate inputs, the total amount of labor, the total amount of capital. <coughs> We have aggregate output, which is real GDP. And then we have some sort of aggregate technology. And what is it going to include? Well, it's going to include all the things that were in the micro-level production function, right? 
our level of scientific knowledge embodied in my head or embodied in our machines is going to matter. <coughs> the sort of overall productivity um, of management around the economy and the way the organizations are set up around is going to matter as well. Um, there's one more thing that's going to matter. Remember how we were discussing how organization, <coughs> you know, the rules of the game that's embodied in, let's say, I know, some um, various documents in the university or in some company, those obviously are going to constrain or enable different kinds of behavior, which may be productive or not. The same is going to be true if we now step outside of the company and think of the economy as a whole. Right? The United States has a variety of rules about what you can and can't do. You do certain things, you, go to, you get sued. Um, certain other things are allowed. The things that are allowed here may be very different from what is or isn't allowed in, I don't know, Egypt. So, <clears throat> and those affect not just, actually those affect two things, right? They affect what happens inside companies. They affect how companies relate to each other. They affect how people move between companies as well, right? Um, which affects how knowledge spreads. Right. There, may be, maybe if you, there may be countries where, for example, if you are hired and you have certain knowledge, it's illegal for you to go to another company and apply that knowledge there. And another place where that's allowed. And so in one place, knowledge spreads, and, and for better or for worse, and in another one, it doesn't. So we can sum that up as saying that when you think from an aggregate perspective, maybe even micro, because of course these things constrain what happens in an individual firm as well, right? the overall economic regulations or, I guess, policies that the government has adopted um, are going to affect <coughs> the process of combining inputs into outputs. And of course, intuitively, that means all of these things can also increase or decrease how much GDP you might be able to generate. And that's slowly stepping in the direction of what I suggested, which is that even though this is a fairly simple metaphor, it's actually going to give us some fairly powerful implications that are going to help us think about <coughs> our big problems, which are trying to understand why economic growth occurs and why the business cycle occurs. Um, before that, I'm going to give you um, another piece of information. Notice that most of the things that are here are measurable. What I mean by that? We can measure total hours worked, or the Bureau of Labor Statistics can. We can measure how much capital there is in operation. How do we do that? Well, it's, it's a bit tricky, but the way we do it is um, the following. Say big K means capital. Okay? And let's say T is time, as in today, the date. Then T minus one would be last date, let's say last year. T plus one is the next date, the next year. Suppose this is the total capital stock that we have now. How much is it gonna be tomorrow? Well, these things are durable, right? But they don't last forever. So some of it may have worn down. Do you know what you call machinery that wears down? Or is retired? It's called depreciation. So imagine that some share, um, D, 
of the capital breaks down or is thrown away each year, then the amount of capital that depreciated is going to be D times K, right? So let's say 10% of capital breaks down. That means 0.1 of K is gone. But then, of course, there are also additions to the capital stock. Where are the additions to the capital stock? They're right here. So we'll always have this as a way of trying to measure the capital stock. You need to have measured how much capital there was at some point. But subject to that, as long as you can measure how much depreciation there is, you know how much investment there was, so you can, fit, you can use that to keep track of what's the capital stock. So we know how much labor there is, and using this idea, we can always figure out how much capital stock there is. And we know what real GDP is. So if we know what the inputs are, and we know what the output is, and we know this year after year after year after year, what does that mean? It means maybe we can figure out what the production function is. So I'm going to tell you what it is. It turns out that the following production function works pretty well. And it works pretty well in most countries of the world, actually. It's kind of interesting. It's this. Um, okay, if you look at the textbook, real GDP is often referred to using the letter Y. I'm not going to clutter this up, so I'm just going to write real GDP. Let's do it this way. Real GDP seems to be roughly the capital stock to the power of a third times, it's called labor L, to the power of two thirds. <clears throat> and how did we get this? This actually is consistent with the idea that labor gets about two thirds of GDP and that it doesn't change over time. I'm not going to derive it for you, but that's, this is kind of what you end up with. Times some number. I can put a little T on each of them so to remind us that these things change over time. <clears throat> Although I guess we didn't need this for what comes next, but anyway, that's, that just happens to be um, true. This particular thing seems to do very well. And I said that this way of viewing production actually can be useful for saying something about our two big themes, the two big themes that we've looked at so far, which is why is there economic growth and why is there the business cycle? Well, we know there's economic growth, right? Over long periods of time, GDP tends to go up. If we have time, I'll show you this again, then that it's not just true for the United States. Um, <clears throat> if GDP growth is a thing, in other words, if GDP grows over long periods of time, one of two things must be true. If this is going up over time, one of two things must be true. Either this is going up over time, or the technology is improving over time, or both, right? But at least one of those must be true. And why is this useful? It's useful because now we can focus on those two things. Is growth happening because the inputs are going up over time, or is growth happening because technology is improving? It gives us a very, very narrow th two narrow things to focus on when trying to answer, why is there economic growth? <clears throat> And you might say, well, we know labor is increasing over time. Right? The population is growing. But what does that mean? We know that G it's not just real GDP that's growing over time. It's real GDP per capita. 
So, to be more precise, if there is economic growth, what must there mean? It means, again, either technology is improving, or there must be more capital per person. One of those two things, or maybe both, must be behind, must be the root of long-run economic growth, or both. So we'll focus on that. We'll try and figure out which one it is. And we'll do that next week. Second, we have the business cycle, <clears throat> which is ignoring economic growth. We have the economy sometimes growing faster, sometimes slower. Right? So we know the business cycle is there. Why does it exist? There are two possibilities. If this thing is fluctuating over time, again, either the technology must be fluctuating, in, in other words, it may, we know it improves, but maybe it improves in fits and starts. And again, if there are fits and starts, it could be either of these that's involved, right? It could be that scientific knowledge improves at an uneven rate, or I guess scientific knowledge maybe not improves, but is implemented at an uneven rate, because an invention is going to take some time before it actually results in any goods. Or management and organization improves over time, but at uneven rates. And you might wonder, management improves? Yes, there is actually economic research that suggests that there are one factor of improvements in technology over time is actually improvements in management. We learn about each other, not just, and how to manage teams, not just about how to combine atoms. Or regulations and policies could change in manners that make the technology improve, may improve productivity, or lower it. So either, if there's a business cycle, either the technology must be improving at an uneven rate, or there are fluctuations in the use of inputs. For some reason, things happen, and suddenly not as much labor is used. Or something happens, and suddenly not as much capital is used, or it's not used as intensively. So let's go with the first one, the first one meaning economic growth. Um, <clears throat> I'm just curious, how many of you think that the deep... So we'll, we'll of course, talk about this, but I just thought it would be useful to see what your prior is, what you thought before coming here. How many of you think that the deep cause of economic growth is improvements in technology? Let's raise your hands. How many of you think the deep cause of economic growth is increases in the amounts of inputs available to the workers? Okay. So, I don't know wins the day. Um, I guess more of you raised your hand there than there, but um, most of you didn't react. Yes, sir. Sorry? Or both, right, I guess. If you, could, you could raise your hand for both, I guess. <laughs> That's Okay, how about both? Okay, so it wasn't that you were agnostic. It's not that you didn't care or know or have an opinion or didn't know what to say. It's that you actually thought both. Okay, great. That's fine. Thank you. Good point. So um, how about the business cycle? How many of you think the main cause of the business cycle is unevenness in technology, where technology is this broad set of things? How many of you think it's fluctuations in the use of inputs? And what about both? Yeah. OK. So when we talk, we'll, we'll talk about economic growth soon. But when it comes to the business cycle, it turns out that there are different schools of economists who have different views on this. So when we get to talk about the business cycle, we'll actually entertain the different views. And um, <clears throat> for example, where I went to graduate school, there are professors there, mo most of them, had, not all of them, had very strong views that it was actually this that was behind both growth and the business cycle, interestingly. But broadly, I think 
that's not true. I think most economists actually think it's fluctuations in inputs that are behind, largely behind the business cycle. And then again, there's some who, like many of you apparently, think, well, sometimes it might be one thing, sometimes it might be the other thing. And we'll <clears throat> eventually think about, well, if it's fluctuations in inputs, what would we expect the business cycle to look like? If it's fluctuations in technology, what would we expect the business cycle to look like? Turns out, they would look different. And we'll see that sometimes the business cycle looks like something that was driven by this, and other times it looks like it's something that's driven by this. In particular, in times of <clears throat> very high inflation, like now, it looks like something that might be driven by this. We'll get to that soon. Any questions, comments, thoughts about this? So again, the business cycle is a very simple metaphor, but it already narrowed things down in a sense that um, <clears throat> when we're trying to ask why is something happening, we now have two really simple, distinct things to look at um, that are quite different. So let me see. We're still, we still have a bit of time. We end at 10.50, is that right? Yeah. So I guess there's a little more we can do. And maybe what I can do with this time is show you a little bit of data. <clears throat> you can see that I'm in Blackboard. My Blackboard looks a bit different from yours, so let me make it look like yours. I'm trying to post everything that we use in this class on Blackboard. I just wanted to show you some motivating data, because the next thing we want to do, having decided that if there's economic growth, it must be because there are improvements in technology or improvements in input, is look at some more data so that we know that if we're going to try and understand economic growth, our theory of economic growth has to be able to explain certain things. One thing we'll have to explain is why does economic, why it, <clears throat> does GDP per capita increase over time? Clearly. Um, that's this. Right, this is US GDP. I think you've seen this picture from um, the first day. So a theory of economic growth will have to explain why, um, on average, GDP tends to go <clears throat> up over time. Um, it would certainly be nice if it could explain what happened after 2008. Although, again, as we discussed, there may not be a puzzle there because a huge amount of people left the workforce. So maybe GDP per capita isn't the right number. It should be GDP per worker. And then maybe, maybe it doesn't look so, so weird. But there are more puzzles. Notice this figure. Here I decided, rather than looking just at the United States, why don't we look at um, a bunch of other countries? What do we see happening if we look at other countries? And here are the other countries that I picked just happen to be in Asia. Um, these are countries that used to be known as the I guess they were called the Asian tigers at some point, right? And you can see that they are growing. Um, well, hold on. The red line is the United States. And you can see that um, some of these, con these countries are growing actually faster than the United States. And some of them caught up. Uh, one of them overtook. And then you have the People's Republic of China that's low, but also growing super, super fast. So this picture focusing on this particular set of countries would suggest that you know, if you're behind in terms of real GDP per capita, maybe you grow faster and catch up. Um, this idea, or this phenomenon, I guess, where countries that, are, that start with lower GDP per capita for whatever reason 
um, grow faster and maybe catch up with wealthier countries, we're going to refer to this phenomenon as convergence. Okay? So whatever theory of economic growth we come up with, it's going to have to be able to explain things like this happening. That um, <clears throat> there's some process whereby whatever it is that drives economic growth, if you're behind, you can actually catch up and maybe even occasionally overtake a wealthier place. Again, the United States here is there as a benchmark. It's a very large economy. It's a very wealthy economy. It's not the place with the highest GDP per capita, obviously. According to this, Singapore overtook it. And then there are a few other countries that did as well, like Qatar. But it's a good benchmark as a large economy that, um, <clears throat> that has, that's also fairly wealthy. Now let's cast a wider net. So here, I think I've included the entire world in one group or another. The red at the top is North America. And then the blue below it is Europe and Central Asia. And the green is Latin America. The purple is the Middle East. The gray is the Arab world. OK, I sh shouldn't have had that, because that's part of the Middle East. So that's duplicate. Um, the yellow is East Asia and Pacific. And this is, um, these two kind of overlap, but they're West and Central Africa and East and Southern Africa. Do we see convergence here? We, you think so? Not really. Well, actually the yellow one, yeah, right? The yellow one is doing something. Those are the countries we looked at two minutes ago. But for the rest, not really, right? There's no convergence going on. So, so we do see some convergence among some places, but for some reason, if we look broadly, we don't see convergence. And that's weird. Well, it's interesting, I guess, if we're economists, if we're scientists. So our theory of economic growth is going to have to account for the fact that everywhere is sort of growing. Even these are growing, it's just that because they're such low numbers, it's hard to see their, their slope. Um, but they're not converging, although some are. So we have to both be able to account for the fact that there is convergence among some places, but there isn't among many others. We try to have to figure out what makes, what's different about these places, let's say. That means that some, everyone grows, some, can, some grow faster than others and, let's say, converge to the wealthier places. But many don't. And again, as discussed, we're going to have to approach this. Excuse me. Our production function idea that's back here tells us that the way to approach this is trying to understand, um, is it because of something to do with capital? Or is it because it's something to do with technology? And again, technology has all these different aspects. If and if it's because of some difference in technology, which one might it be? Because we know that, um, let's think in terms of scientific knowledge, it's, or, um, it's not like, let's say, um, advanced um, machinery like computers and so mobile phones aren't available everywhere. So deep down, there must be some if, if there must be something um, else going on. It's not that scientific knowledge can't spread around the world; it's not available. So if it's something to do with technology, it must be one of the other ones. Yes, sorry. Um, it's true that if there's conflict, obviously that's going to mess up everything in. I guess you could think of conflict as <clears throat> sort of, um, I guess you could think of it as sort of some sort of regulation and policies that's just a disaster, like destructive <laughs> policies rather than constructive ones. Um, so we could kind of think of it in there. But um, let's say looking at, it's not true that all of Africa is in conflict. 
In fact, um, most of it isn't. Or, yeah. or Latin America, for that matter. Not that things are going great. I'm, I'm from Peru, and if you look at the news there, it's a big mess. And, um, though it wasn't a year ago. So, <clears throat> so yeah, conflict certainly is a, is a major problem. But it's, it, it, can't, it can't explain all of this. Um, any thoughts, comments, ideas? Yes? Um, right, I guess there's, that's, so conflict is sort of the worst form of institutions, I guess, if you want to call it that, but I guess it means they've broken down. Um, the fragil but fragility might be a problem too, right? If you're afraid of them breaking down, then you might behave differently from if you have full confidence in your institutions, right? Why, um, if you think the, if you think lawlessness is going to happen tomorrow, maybe you won't invest today in something productive. So fragility could be a problem. Conflict is, of course, the, the, the I guess your worst fear is materialized if there's conflict. And someone back there, yes? Access to resources. Um, um, that's it's true that if you so a long time ago there was this literature by which I mean scientific I guess the economics research literature where um, economists were <coughs> um, running regressions which just means you know trying to see what statistically correlates with growth or with the level of GDP and they were throwing <coughs> anything they could think of in, which is kind of silly, it's kind of like data mining, but then eventually they f tried to figure out what kinds of things really stand out as being possible determinants of, of wealth. And one of the things that was found, okay, this, I guess, I guess what you're saying is there's certain geographic factors that might matter, right? and there is some evidence for that. Um, for example, if you're landlocked, that's a big problem. Um, because, of course, ports mean that you have much easier access to things. If you don't have certain resources, then ports mean that you can access them anyway because someone can ship them to you. Um, if you're landlocked, it means you're further from ports and so it might be actually difficult. So, definitely. So we have some ideas there. There's some sort of fundamental, like, what, okay, let's, let's do the flip side. Why is Qatar the country with the highest GDP per capita? Sorry. Because they have gas. A lot of it. And a small population. They have nice beaches, too, I am told, but that's probably not why they're super wealthy. Maybe I'll go there sometime. That would be nice. All right. Any other questions, comments, thoughts? Okay. Yes. Go ahead. In the United States. In North America. That's true. You can see here is two thousand and eight. Great Recession, as the macroeconomists call it. Here is COVID. They're less visible in the other lines, but that's just because you know, the other lines are lower and smaller, and so any variation is harder to see. <clears throat> Let's see. We have 10 minutes left, so I actually put together a little exit quiz for you. I made it smaller than last time. I think maybe it's better if it's not too long. So please go to this place and, um, oops, I got snagged. And whoever is the winner, I have a small prize for you.
have to use your real name. But then if you don't, then it may be harder for me to figure out what the winner is if it happens to be you. Your choice. Okay. We're up to 150. I think that's almost everyone. Ready, steady. All right. to get it wrong now than on the midterm. That's the whole point of this, by the way. Call the processes that combine inputs. Which of these is not part of technology? machinery and structure. Third is G cell. Second is JB, and our winner is. Oh, yeah. All right. Good luck, everyone. Um, thanks for coming. Look forward to seeing you next week. Feel free to get in touch with me if you want to about anything. Don't forget to do your homework, and if you're if you're calling, please come up and I have a little something for you. Thank you. Have a good weekend.